Travis, can you talk about the history of diabetes? Because like you have researched a lot about that. Yeah, sure. Um, all right, great. Um, so this is my website here. Uh, we have 509 total entries right now. Um, so what I do is I do type two diabetes right here. So uh, this filters out the spot. So this means there's 200 entries or maybe a hundred entries. I think there's 10 a page. Um, so I, I made a bas basically a history of the last 2000 years. Um, it doesn't really get interesting until the 1600s. Um, Thomas Willis, he actually tastes tea and they could taste that it was sweet right here, even a little delicious. Mm. Um, and they started realizing that there was something wrong in the digestion that was preventing the assimilation of sugar or vegetable matter. Yeah. Um, this guy, Sidenham, he actually made a treatment for diabetes that was like accidentally right. Because uh, <laughs> he thought that meat was easy to digest and he thought plants were really hard to digest. So he's just like, eat meat. Um, and it said no to effective dietetic treatment grew out of this advice. But I was like, yeah, I don't know. You could actually make that work. Um, because here they put uh, urine in a little Petri dish and figured it out. Oh, you'll like this quote real fast. Um, so Gary Tobbs is why I got into all this stuff originally. Um, and he wrote, I did this obsessive research because I wanted to know what was reliable about the nature of a healthy diet. Borrowing from the philosopher of science, Robert Merton, I wanted to know if what we thought we knew was really so. I applied a historical perspective to this controversy because I believe that understanding that context is essential for evaluating and understanding the competing arguments of beliefs. Doesn't the concept of knowing what you're talking about literally require, after all, that you know the history of what you believe, of your assumptions, and of the competing belief systems, and so the evidence on which they're based? So I just love that. You know, something like I, I read this recently, and in the case for keto, I was like, I gotta add this to my to my database. Um, so it starts getting really good right around. This is when America had its revolution in 1776. So basically the history of diabetes is really like the history of America. <laughs> These were some early scientists. Now, it really gets interesting with Dr. John Rollo. Um, so he was a Scottish doctor and he traveled to Barbados and the Caribbean in the 1770s. And he met some diabetics um, and, and he went to this, uh, oh, it's not on here, but there's another entry in here. So when he went to uh, St. Lucia, which was another island, he, he, he went to this fishing village and all the people were really healthy and they were taking fish from the sea and they were eating like a more meat-based diet. And then on the same island on the other side, there is like a harbor. There are farms, sugar plantations, uh, obviously shifted foods from the colonies, but then also, you know, like the local farm foods in that town. And everyone there was sick and unhealthy. So already this doctor had figured out that there is like a difference in diet. And he actually said that like nutrition was what mattered. Um, so he, he like made this comparison and I think it primed him for the rest of his life to think about nutrition as a way to cure disease. Um, and that ended up being the case here. He found one diabetic in 1777 and then here in 1796, so it's 20 years later, he meets this guy, Captain Meredith. 
Captain Meredith was 34 and he was 232 pounds. But when you get type two diabetes, you're not able to make insulin anymore. So you actually lose weight because insulin is a fat storage hormone. So when people are getting type two diabetes, they would usually be kind of chubby and obese. 232 is, uh, he's six foot one, so he's my height, but adding you know, an extra 90 pounds, 80 pounds to someone, not a good idea. So he dropped down to, this is what I usually weigh, it's 162 or so. And he was really bad off. So Rollo gave him a treatment. Uh, the diet to consist of animal food principally and to be thus regulated. Um, make a plant blood pudding made of blood and suet, dinner and game or old meats, which have been long kept fat and rancid old meats. I think he asked for more rancid meats because they're more easy to, to, to uh, digest, I guess. They're like tender. But this advice ended up being changed in the future. Um, but you'll see there's not really any sugar or vegetables in this. Uh, they they kind of added a lot. They tried They experimented in all sorts of different medicines and stuff. I don't really know what this is. Uh, tincture of opium like it's probably not a good idea <laughs> um so anyway this helped out and it's captain meredith i guess he lived uh it, but there was a second patient who was less cooperative and he died at 57 so he wasn't able to the cognitive dissonance was too big or he was addicted to apple pudding and sugar in his tea and wine. So um, a lot of these doctors do say like, oh yeah, when people fail, they fail. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, oh, so here's the, so later in that year, Captain Mary did the treatment. They stopped with the opium and he did this quite faithfully, recording his transgressions. And then the doctor said, you know what, dude, you really got to, you got to finish. You got to go all out. Don't cheat, basically, right? Yeah. Um, eventually, he lost weight and felt well. Um, Okay, so then Rollo has these two cases, and he's like, boy, everyone needs to know about this. I basically cured one guy, and I was helping the other guy, and then he got addicted to sugar again and then died. So he published a case study. Um, if you want to, you can click on any of these comments, and it opens up a bigger view. And you can even open up the original link I found this at. You see these old scanned books. Um, Either I would type out directly what's on here or scroll through here. You can also download the text file here and then copy text out of that. But um, it's pretty cool. All these old books are available. You can yeah. look at that. Oh, look, case one, John McLean, Porter. A lot of these, like, I can just keep adding more and more. But... Um, so, 1798 comes around, uh, this Redfern doctor now starts using Rollo's thing, and now we're off to the races because consensus is starting to be built, right? Yeah. The old theory is that everything is fine, more or less, and now it's like, oh, sugar is causing diabetes, and all meat diets are curing it. Um, so I, I love the the way people wrote back then, you know, just to, one, of the, one of the amazing things with this database is just reading everything they wrote was amazing. Um, 
I therefore immediately suggested to him the propriety and the absolute necessity of abstaining rigidly from all fermented liquors and vegetables with everything else that could impart oxygen to the system by the prima vi, and at the same time ordered that his diet should consist principally of fat beef, pork, and such ailments as were of a gross or unctuous quality, and most likely to produce hydrogen in the greatest abundance. Uh, he never once deviated from the regimen prescribed. My patient has now continued perfectly well for more than eight months, and he has never enjoyed a better state of health. And this was 223 years ago. Yeah. What? <laughs> um, so right after that came out, um, this guy named John Lath Latham, uh, wrote a book with some case studies that he was used. Uh, he used the all meat diet to treat diabetes. And here's some case studies here. Um, pretty much the same. Uh, you know, some of them would be helped and some of them wouldn't. But as I have seen the best effects by limiting the use of vegetables, and if possible, preventing it entirely, I urge this point as much as I could. But I am afraid I was but perfectly obeyed. So doctors, you know, they're all trying to get these people to do it, and people don't always do it. And, you know, nothing has changed really in hundreds of years. <laughs> yes. uh, so I published all these. So now after like the early 1800s, um, you'll see there's a big gap, 1811 to 1841. But really like the 18, the mid 1850s were like a time of science and physiology and understanding like better how this process worked. Uh, so Boucherat also knew of Rollo and I think he allowed some vegetables. Uh, it's in that web Carb tolerance is raised by outdoor exercise. There's glycerol for sweetening purposes. All right. Ooh, yeah, this is cool. Uh, so in 1853, if you look closely at the eye when someone has type 1 diabetes and they have a high blood sugar their whole life, uh, the veins in the eyes, you can see they go bad, basically. So uh, in 1855, they figured out, or 1853, they figured out for the first time that this was like a real problem. So if anyone ever says, so... It's okay to have high blood sugar <laughs> and we tell them we've known for 150 years that it's not the case um oh it's a long entry all right so mr harvey oh so you've probably heard of uh banting right william banting yeah yeah so banting he was a uh a mortician in london and 10 years later he writes a little pamphlet but I actually looked up the doctors that he cited, and the doctor, Mr. Harvey, had gone to Paris in 1856 and met this guy named Bernard, who was talking about like the physiology of the body and how the liver and pancreas works. And then Harvey comes home and realizes, oh, maybe I could try this pure animal diet uh to arrest the undue formation of fat which he thought was happening when you eat uh sugar so he had long been known that a purely animal diet greatly assisted uh so good uh, so William Harvey, uh, 1864. Um, so here's this guy, Griesinger. He publishes 225 cases of diabetes. 
and I think he used the meat diet as well. He was able to figure out that like if you have protein and fat on the diet, if you have more protein than fat, you can actually turn the protein into sugar. Um, sugar excretion equaling 60% of the diet. Uh, Pavi comes along. So around the 1850s, Boucheret, the guy who we already talked about, kind of allowed vegetables. And then doctors would kind of go either way. You know, they'd say like, oh, you do better without them, but you can eat them if it increases your compliance, right? So it's like a low-carb diet, keto. Um, I, th I Honestly, this point has been debated over and over like the last 50 150 or 200 years, and I don't think anyone knows for sure either way. Um, but you know, if you eat low carb veggies, they're obviously better than high carb veggies, um, and it's pretty tough to figure out otherwise if the uh, vegetables are causing diseases. Um, here's Claude Bernard. Um, yeah, he fed dogs carbohydrates or meat. Figured out how the liver worked. And killed them immediately after feeding. He observed large amounts of sugar in the hepatic, that's the liver veins. The same observation was done in the control group. Animals were fed only by meat. So he realizes like meat is made by fat and protein, and sugar is made out of sugar. And the liver does all the digesting of those two. And this is in 1850 or 1865. So, so Bernard influenced Harvey. Harvey influences uh, Banting. I don't know why Banting isn't in here. Um, cool thing is on desktop, you can use a search. And this is 1863, so this is the Banting entry. Yes. Um, and I put his whole pamphlet in here. I guess it's advice. Fish, meat. He did more of a low carb diet, and he had like some alcohol and uh, a couple slices of bread here and there, but more or less pretty carnivore. Um, So 1865, uh, let's move a little fast. Oh, so Cantani was a uh, Italian doctor and I guess he learned about this, I'm not sure who he learned it from, uh, but he was very stringent in his application of it and would lock people in like his clinic more or less, which was like a jail cell. <laughs> Because he's like, you guys can't be trusted to eat carbs on your own. So I'm going to prevent and force you not to eat. Um, but he had, had, he has an amazing book. So his book is published in French. Um, he was Italian. And then I read his book. This, and I translated it to English using this Google thing and then copied all these entries along all his pages. Uh, yeah, I guess you can open these up, right? And I would copy all this and split them all up by the entries. Zero to 150 cases of diabetes. And the amazing thing about these entries is everyone has diabetes is addicted to starch and he very easily figured this out um, with the meat diet cardinal a priest was guilty of abuse of flour for a year <laughs> <laughs> um so i started grouping up many case studies at once um, also abuse sugar, 
exclusively flour and sweet fruits. Eat meat very rarely. A large consumer of flour, of fruit and sugar. Re eat even at night candy, fruit and candy. A fat constitution. He had always eaten a lot of starchy foods. It's just, it should pop out, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, go through all those. I added 73 full case studies to my database from Cantani. All right, I think. Oh yeah, Mr. Adamo. Um, it's cool. I tried looking up some of these people too, to like cross reference them, but yeah. it gets a lot harder because different languages and stuff. Um, it elicits of forbidden foods, starches and sugars, and anything which contains all fruits, <laughs> jams of all kinds. So meats and deli meats are acceptable, and you can have olive oil and herbs. They even add gluten flour then. I think Boucheret actually invented gluten flour instead of regular flour, so it's like more high protein and less carby. Recommended foods or meat. Um, okay, so let's get through Cantani. All right, eighteen seventy four Brunton. He describes meat, fish, eggs, and fat, and low carb veggies to treat diabetes. More Cantani. Uh, there were other doctors that Cantani treated also. Um, Dr. G, Dr. Pascal. So doctor treating doctor. Doctors were lover of starches. <laughs> Extremely amylivorous. Uh, uh, the amylus uh enzyme you know and it means starch digesting right so this means starch eating or starch lover um yeah this this entry goes over his whole philosophy uh, eliminated daily food intake to about one pound of cooked meat Glycosuria persisted. He fasted his patients. The meat diet would continue for several months, but if urine was not free of sugar, it would extend to six or nine months. So he'd basically stretch it out, measure your your uh, sugar in your pee every day, and basically track it and make sure you don't leave until it's really gone. Um, and then, like, once you, they're gone, like, they kind of go back to their old diet, more or less, and then kind of diabetes comes back. So, Kintani basically just keeps trying to get people to stick on keto for life, and it's hard. <laughs> um, I think we all can agree it's a challenge. Uh, but lots of these scientists were arguing about this. Um, this is entry from. Yeah, I must have gotten this from another book. Oh, here. Um, all right. Mark and Tani. All right, so Nounen, uh, another German doctor, champion of strict carbohydrate free diet. Um, and he also locked patients in their rooms for five months. Um, you notice the pancreas, it's, it's involved in nervous system. They uh, would take a dog and take out their pancreas and then figure out what changed in the dog. And he actually noticed um, that when 
the dogs without pancreas feed, the flies would settle in the sweet tea and be like eating that. And so he's like, why, why would, you know, flies like this one urine more than the other and then tasted it and realized, oh, there's no sugar. So uh, always pay attention. Um, so Salisbury, he actually, I, I have another entry in here. This is limited to diabetes, of course. Um, but he tried various uh, elimination diets where he'd eat only one thing at a time. Yeah. And one, he tried his first experiment, he only ate uh, baked beans. And after three days, he quit because he was farting so much and he felt so terrible. So eventually, he came across minced ground meat. Um, and you know there would be some fat and some protein in there and he was like oh this alone is like all humans need to eat so um he ended up writing a book and yeah he he had figured that chronic disease was caused by eating starches and 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 plant foods and then that this all meat uh salisbury steak would actually like reverse diabetes and you could live on it alone as like a human. Um, and also 1880s, this is basically when like a lot of ethnography was going on. Um, and like, like the civilized like white um, explorers were like on the edges of the world in like these remote places where hunter gatherers still lived. And uh, those hunter gatherers are basically living carnivore diets, like the Eskimos and stuff. Yeah. Um, and then, like the whale traders and the trappers, they would import their own white foods into the area, and then people change their economy and stop being able to hunt all winter. And now they have to trap foxes instead, and then they change their diet, right? Yeah. So. Uh, this whole time period, like you also start seeing like diabetes popping up in like these ancient races that had always been immune from it because now they are starting to eat starches as well. Um, well, we'll get into that stuff later, but um, I just was reminded that like in the 1880s and 1850s, really, like the Eskimos started to be discovered. And at the same time, like people discovered, oh wow, these people that live on all meat diets, like uh, we, can, they also realized they could do it as a way to treat diabetes. Um, so this guy William Osler, he was a huge doctor in uh, Baltimore in America, um, and he said the carbohydrates in the food should be reduced to a minimum. And here's his list of articles which diabetic patients may take. All the animal food you could want. And then of bread, gluten and bran bread, almond, coconut biscuits, and some low carb veggies. And any nuts, I guess, and some citrus fruits. So, and all these very high carb things are omitted. Um, well, yeah, enough, they even omit uh, seafood. I mean, there is a few carbs in seafood, I wonder why. Um, so Osler also talks about gout. Um, gout is also caused by starchy and saccharine articles of food. And if you take them very low, gout is reversed. Who knew? Uh, so Joslyn is another doctor. He was treating type 1 diabetes. Um, so type 1 diabetes tends to be in younger people. Um, they, they don't really need like a whole lifetime to get sick from type 2 diabetes. And they have some autoimmune problem and their pancreas no longer makes insulin at all, um, so they lose like almost all their weight and they get 
super skinny, and then they die. Um, so they realize, like, if you feed these type 1 diabetics all meat diets, then they can survive a longer time. Um, but it wasn't until 1921 that they invented insulin and started injecting it into these type 1s. And then that allowed them to basically live as long as they wanted um, with some complications. Um, so Dr. Romick, yeah, yeah, yeah. So 1896, here we have Alaskan natives on this carnivore diet. The people are strong, did not get scurvy, did not have gastric ulcer, cancer, diabetes, malaria, or typhoid fever. So a lot of these early like explorers have been going to uh, the new world and realized, wow, like, none of these people have any of the diseases we're used to at, at home. And oh, they're only eating fat and protein and animal products. Pretty strange, right? But this is how consensus works, right? Like if something is true, you expect it to pop up all over the place. All sorts of doctors rediscovering it. Like it's cool that Salisbury figured it out on his own using his own ordination diet. And then these other doctors heard case studies and tried out different things and you know, they kept finding it was tough to get people to stay on the diet long term. How do you convince people to change their mind, right? Uh, so one of Jocelyn's patients was his own mother. Um, and you'll always find, I think, in history of, like, doctors is that, like, when doctors can have their own problem and they're trying to fix themselves, they're far better doctors because, you know, they really understand the patient and they're trying to get healing and not just symptom relief. Um, and when it comes to have, having your own mother with a disease, then you really understand it. Um, so he was able to use like a low sugar diet with his mom she lost 20 pounds over 15 years because she was a type 2 diabetic at age 60. Restriction of carbohydrates and the temporary utilization of an oatmeal diet, which would have been a much more high fiber, sugar disappeared. Just a little science. Um, Frederick Allen discovered that when dogs with only 20% of their pancreas was left after surgery on an Eskimo diet, they may be found to live in health. On a Hindu diet, they go down to fatal diabetes, proving that low carb diets could be sustained with low pancreas function. So basically they did surgery and they took out pancreas and they cut out 80% of it. And the dogs could still eat meat and digest it because the meat had wasn't high in carbohydrates and a little bit of the pancreas could release enough insulin to digest the protein and the fat, which still requires a little bit of insulin, but not a lot. Um, whereas if they tried to eat carbohydrates, this 20% um, large pancreas just wasn't able to make enough insulin to deal with the huge amount of sugar and then they got diabetes very quickly. So um, not that I'm saying anyone should add more pancreases to their body, I'm saying don't eat sugar. <laughs> um, so the beginning of World War One, 1940, the English Journal repeats the claims of a German science paper by highlighting that it's shown that variations in the content of the sugar in the blood are due to eating carbohydrate. And the amount of carbohydrate, such as 100 grams, can lead to unmistakable glycosuria. So that's the limit right there. Like once you eat more than 100 grams, it pops up in your sugar, uh, in your bloodstream. Uh, so here's Dr. Allen, all the diet. <laughs> tried a vegetarian and all meat diet. I love uh, some of these case studies, really, really fascinating. Abnormal thirst first noted. 
the first patient for the proposed treatment. She's closer to coma. So she had type one diabetes, I think. Uh, the bag, low carb, sort of. Uh, oh yeah, so she did vegetarian for the first couple months and then actually changed. The doctor was able to convince her to try carnivore and then she lived really well through that uh, fall. And then I think she went back and then she died. Um, yeah, they even compare the vegetarian and the carnivore diets. Bare possibility that meat protein might be at least stimulate a greater flow of gastric juice. Um, so Jocelyn publishes this book, 1960, um, and he hadn't figured out how to use insulin yet, but was using low carb diets to kind of extend the life of type one diabetics. Uh, they eventually died of coma, diabetes is chronic disease. Feeding and fasting is useful. And then you have like a 20 to 40 grams carbohydrate. Yeah, there, there's like a quota there. Um, so Jocelyn keeps publishing his case reports. It has a thousand of his diabetes cases. Um, diabetic cookery with valuable foods or meat products, strictly forbidden, all starches. Um, they figure out how blood sugar is digested. Hyperglycemia resulting from the second dose is lower than that after the first. And that means there's more insulin pumped out or something. Um, Louis Newberg, uh, this guy is talked about in Gary Tops' book. A diet whose energy came largely from fat to which was added sufficient protein and the minimal carbohydrate. Glycosuria, it's like high blood sugar, was avoided in severe diabetics. Acidosis was not produced. 28 cases contained in table one show that a high fat diet such as we have used is capable of bringing blood sugar down to normal. It's amazing, right? Yeah. Uh, so this guy, Fred Banting, is not William Banting and they're not even in the same family. I looked it up. Um, he collaborated with this doctor best and they figured out how the pancreas worked the other digestion pieces of the body. And they basically figure out how to grind up the pancreas more or less and make insulin. And these, these tips would be used to make insulin like a year later. Um, so this was the first time it was ever used. 14 year old Canadian boy Dropped his blood glucose from 520 to 120 in a day. <laughs> uh, so at this point, kid was already eating as little as possible, right? So like the more carbs you eat, the more you waste away, more or less. Uh, 15 milliliters of insulin injected in his butt. So they improved the quality and then they had excellent results. He died of pneumonia at 27 years old. So he actually doubled his lifespan. Pretty great. Um, and this, uh, this is another type one diabetic. She was, a uh, daughter of a politician was actually much better off and she lived to be 74 years old and then she died of a heart attack which i think is linked to insulin resistance and eating carbs more or less so 
although she lived a long kind of normal life, I think she still kind of died of what most people die of. Um, but yeah, she was really close to death and started taking insulin just in the nick of time. Um, so th this is kind of like an interesting point in the story because before we could only use diet to help these people and now we were able to add drugs to them. And you could help type one diabetics live a normal life and type two diabetics, their insulin and their pancreas would kind of deteriorate after a decade or two of being a type two diabetic. You basically ruin the pancreas over time. But if you go back to a meat only diet, like, like those dogs with their 20% pancreas left, right? Like you're kind of like in that state and you can still digest meat just fine. So yeah, like an all meat diet would reverse diabetes more or less in your type two diabetics, but not in your type one diabetics. Um, but now insulin will save the life of a type one diabetic and a low carb diet will keep him at its, his healthiest state. So now the, the controversy was, do you feed people high carb diets with loss of insulin and keep their blood sugar high all the time? Or do you, um, do you uh, like have a low carb diet and then use a little bit of insulin over the course of the day? Um, and that attitude actually is still kind of like a debate, I think. Um, but I, I looked up into the original origins of this Yeah, this Petrin guy also did carnivore. This Russell Wilder guy did carnivore. Um, diet very high in fat. A lot of times when I was doing this research, like one guy would do a research, uh, like a history on all the people he knew. And then I'm doing a history on him. So it's just like history and history and history. And now some people will watch this YouTube video in the future and be like, History just keeps repeating itself. Um, yeah, so Joglin, 1923. And he basically says, don't even bother showing how much carbs are in carby food. They're just completely banned. So now they realize you can eat too much sugar, and then that causes you to hypoglycemic. So we're trying to learn how the insulin wave occurs. You eat a lot of sugar and then you get like your, your hormones can't really deal with like the second shock second shock is more severe than two oh, all right boom so 1928 dr sansom increases the carb content in his type 1 diabetics to 245 grams per day because it was not shown that a high carb diet improved glucose tolerance. As it was shown. Right, right, right. So they were doing glucose tolerance tests and they thought like, oh, well, if you eat lots of carbs, then you can handle other carbs. So that must be the good thing. But they kind of didn't really think of uh, that 1853 diabetic neuropathy patient we saw, right? So they are basically trying to get people to feel normal, whereas the low carber guys were saying, no, we should keep blood sugar as low as possible. Um, but this doctor increased the carb content to about 40% of energy. And this at least is like a low bounds now, you know, um, most, most dietitians and yeah. Guidelines would say around 40 to 60 percent is the right amount for people. Um, so this Mayo based uh, Russell Wilder wrote in 1933, he was using ketogenic meat based diets. Um, and he really noticed like the absence and complaints of hunger have been remarkable. So I know you're eating carnivore, you're not going to be hungry. Um, this is actually a quote, yeah, from Gary Tobbs. So I, I pulled out like, 
the people he cited in his book so that whenever like they pop up again, I can just go to my database and search it and find these old entries. And then I can post this link on the internet. And that's also how I want other people to use this, you know, like know that, know the database exists, find the entry you need, post it. You know, you can't say, oh, you go read this book and learn about this guy. Just say, learn about this guy and now read this book. Um, or this guy matters because, you know, this one particular quote. Um, So this Dr. White was in Alaska and he rarely found chronic disease among the natives. Um, a lot of these doctors did start noticing chronic disease when it did happen because they're used to never seeing it. So when it, they did see it, they were, you know, it really stood out. Um, and really one of the only things I could find was this epstein Barr's virus, which puts like a, uh, like a swelling on your lip. So you end up getting this terrible like cancer thing there of which could kill you. Um, but that's not really caused by like, bad diets. Um, I, I also have like an Eskimo button we can click and there's way more information there. Most of the database is full of that information. Um, so again, this is that insulin versus carbohydrate amounts to be, and they're kind of arguing between the two. This is the consensus, right? Uh, which way does it go? Um, 1940s, so World War II is just starting. Yeah, so Joslin is still a low carber and he's fighting with this Edward Tolstoy guy who thinks like a high blood sugar is better. And they're arguing over longevity and you know, how their patients feel and stuff. And, you know, and these are big high profile debates. They're going to conferences, and, you know, like talking about each other. Uh, it got pretty heated, I guess. Um, we condemn such advice. Uh, I, I think this guy had like a lecture and then after the lecture, Jocelyn wrote to the editor about how bad it, an idea it was. You endeavored to support our convictions by recording the complications, the causes of death and duration of 5,600 people of our fatal cases between 98 and 1940. The table show the decrease of deaths due to coma from 64% to 4% of blah, blah a longer age of life. So it's just gonna say, if you don't eat sugar, by no means can we keep all our patients sugar-free, but we do strive to maintain them under as good control as possible. Um, so basically, eat high sugar, don't live as long. Uh, centennial portrait. Yeah, so Tolstoy, He's now saying like the low carbers are like a religion. And uh, one thing you'll you'll hear a lot if you get into nutrition is like faith and science and how people make their decisions. Gary Tobbs talks about faith all the time. And faith is kind of like your excuse for not having good evidence. Um, and that kind of ends up coming down to that cognitive dissonance and consensus thing we talked about earlier. And it's difficult to get people to change their mind. Um, uh, so 1958, oh yeah, so World War II is long over by now. Um, in Gary Taub's book, he thinks this is kind of pivotal because the Australian researchers were very interested in uh, Austrian, not Austrian, Austrian. Uh, Austria is next to Germany. Um, they were understanding how hormones affect the blood and um, how uh, how like low carb diets like affect the body. But then after World War II ended, they all like left Germany and that whole kind of movement died out. 
and then the American scientists came along and they were all about calories in, calories out and using that for, to treat obesity. So this was kind of like a major point where a consensus shifted. Um, and now in like 1950s America, you know, got like this processed food post world, everyone's kind of like in this new state. And then like, yeah, all these processed foods start coming out and these new oils, soybean oils and stuff. And then high fructose corn syrup is invented and um, and then the calories in, calories out thing is coming out. Uh, so even in 1958, they still don't really know, you know, how many carbohydrates should we eat more or less than 40%, no more than 40%, blah, blah, blah. And carbohydrate restriction is an essential feature, but you know, like they still couldn't really decide. Uh, GU3 also is fighting for zero carb, and he also explains kind of how the other, how this Tolstoy guy was very religious in terms of his arguments. Um, he entered the fray in '64, so he explains like how the his opposite side kind of became commenced. So he started debating his mentor's arguments. Um, and then in 2003, or I guess 1993, there was, yeah, 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 this DCCT results. And that showed that high blood sugar was really lethal. So how to diagnose carbotoxicity with muscle cell biopsies. Um, diet theory of diabetes and analysis of failure. So this is kind of like how our guidelines became more carb centric and less fat centric. So he had actually like experimented with different high carb diets and thought that they were actually helpful to diabetics when they weren't. But um, 97 Bernstein's, this guy actually went to became a doctor after becoming a type 1 diabetic just so he could reverse his disease more or less and he figured out how to run continuous glucose monitors and how to add the right amount of insulin for the carbs he was eating and by eating as few carbs as possible he doesn't have uh really any complications and needs a lot less insulin he's still alive and he's like 80 seven or 88 and he's like you know he still puts out youtube videos every other day and uh is really active and his book diabetes epidemic or no no uh the other book like low car some uh what's it called yeah dr bernstein's diabetes yeah. solution really really good book I need to read. Um, and then this last um, court of last appeal. Um, this guy, George Henderson, you might see him on uh, Twitter. And he wrote this great article, which helped me a lot in researching this whole database. Um, this whole PDF is six pages long. He talked about Cantani and um, Rollo and uh, really put in a lot of context for me. Um, but yeah, that's the history of diabetes, more or less. Um, you no, know, 20, 2018 World Carn Four Month begins, and the rest is history. Subscribe to BNS Goku Great.